Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's webinar, An Introduction to Value Chains. My name is Grant Peden, and I'm a business facilitator with the Entrepreneurs Programme, the Australian Government's flagship initiative for business competitiveness and productivity at the firm level. The Entrepreneurs Programme uh, has a service available called Supply Chain Facilitation, and as part of that service, we conduct uh, analysis of uh, value chain. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Sash Nikolovsky, who's a partner with professional services firm Wilson Pateras. Good morning, Sash. Good morning, Grant. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Sash um, has a particular expertise in business improvement and the way that value chains can be utilised to streamline processes at various production levels and segments within the business environment. Um, he has experience in taxation, finance, accounting, uh, R&D, but in particular um, his specialisation is in business improvement strategies uh, with a focus on value chain innovation and improvements. Um, Sash is a member of CPA Australia. Um, he's a certified tax advisor um, with the Taxation Institute of Australia. Uh, he's a registered tax agent and he holds a degree in commerce from La Trobe University. So welcome Sash. Thank you, Grant, and good morning to everyone and welcome to our uh, webinar today on the introduction uh, to value chains. I hope you can all uh, get a little bit of uh, um, benefit today from our uh, presentation and I'm sure you'll take away something with you today. Uh, I suppose in brief, um, uh, every business today um, competes in a global economy um, and, and, and is in some way affected by uh, the value chain activity. Value chains, value chains are rapidly adopted by firms all over the world um, and is impacting businesses within Australia today in all sectors and in all industries. Uh, prior to uh, our presentation today, you would have uh, received some pre-session notes um, to uh, review um, to get a bit of understanding around value chains. And those pre-session notes would have um, pointed you out to various aspects uh, about the whole uh, series of concepts. One of them would have been um, what is the value chain and that's introduced you to uh, various aspects and also introduced you to a great example in the notes uh, with respect to a winery and a vineyard operation and all the uh, arms and uh, relationships that uh, that vineyard has with its uh, suppliers and all its consumers and so forth to bring about an end product for the consumer. It also looked at uh, Porter uh, and how he's, he has contributed to the value chain model. Uh, it looked at value chains and supply chains as a comparative. It also introduced the notion of uh, value proposition which was a, uh, a recent uh, webinar presentation as well uh, and uh, many people uh, may have seen that uh, in the last uh, uh, few weeks. It also introduced the concept of uh, value chains for in terms of advantages and, and disadvantages so hopefully that uh, pre-session uh, note uh, was uh, a good briefing for everyone um, to gain an understanding of what value chains are. Uh, if you are a business owner, um, understanding value chains is important uh, and it may be useful uh, to be acquainted uh, by it. Um, today I will focus on the key aspects of value chain um, and, and, uh, and matters that are related to it. Today will be, um, the webinar today will uh, go for uh, around an hour, so uh, hopefully we can have all questions uh, sent in and hopefully we can, we'll have enough time to answer them. If not, uh, we'll be, um, uh, I'll be writing to everyone with those questions uh, with a written, written response. I suppose it's uh, good now to introduce our first poll question of the evening just to get a better understanding of uh, knowledge in the area. Our first poll question is, have you heard of the concept of value chain prior to this webinar? So it's a bit of an easy one and hopefully we can get um, some quick responses. Uh, a, yes, no, B, no, C, possibly, and D, not sure. So we'll see how our uh, audience uh, responds, Grant. So jump on, guys, and uh, just use the facility there just to answer the, the polling there. Um, have you heard of the concept of value chain prior to this webinar? Um, and we'll see... See what the existing level of knowledge is, or awareness, I should say. 
it is an interesting concept and a lot has been made of it in recent times, Grant, so uh, more and more traction is being made in this area. So, mm. um, and it looks like mm. uh, the majority of you do, actually. Um, oh, fantastic. So far, everybody, everybody that we have so far has heard of the concept of value chain, which, Brilliant. Is, which is great. Excellent. Okay, so we'll continue on then. Uh, by way of background, the term uh, value chain first came in, into existence in 1985 uh, by its creator, Michael Porter. Uh, through a book he wrote in 1985 called The Competitive Advantage, Creating and Sustaining Superior Performance. Uh, in this book he did, he went on to, and said that, and I'll just paraphrase here, that value chain involves an assortment of activities that companies and its workers plan and partake in, in order to, to uh, take a product from uh, sorry, a product or service from being an idea to becoming a full developed product or service. The value chain has a sound basis uh, as it focuses on the end consumer and all costs and suppliers that lead to the final product or service being developed. There are several char characteristics associated with the value chains, um, but I'll briefly mention uh, two of them that are, are more pertinent to our discussions today. Um, a value chain is a whole series of activities that create and build value at every stage of uh, production from initial uh, idea uh, and conceptual to subsequent distribution and sales. Uh, also the value chain uh, considers price, quality, um, business, continuous improvement, innovation, uh, service delivery <coughs> and competitive advantage that ultimately leads to the consumer satisfaction. A very important notion of uh, value chains is the notion of competitive intelligence which infers uh, in information. Um, it implies finding out information from every source that will give a firm an edge. And, and a firm having an edge is very important from a value chain perspective. Uh, as its strategic direction is usually guided by which segment uh, and which market it, it um, decides to follow. This is a critical function and does underpin every strategy within the value chain process. Uh, steps in Collating information may include things like collecting the data from various sources, from news, media, um, consumer publications, for example. And then it's uh, compiled uh, once it's been co collected. Um, then it's under and then it undertakes a digestive analysis uh, of the actual compiled data. And then it ultimately gets communicated uh, to the decision makers in a firm to make strategic uh, decision making di um, um, uh, directions. Competitive um, intelligence does provide a strategic advantage for your business uh, and, it, and it's, it is slightly different from business intelligence so the two uh, can be compared. Uh, if you compare the two, competitive intelligence uh, involves the analysis of quantitative measures from things like market research and secondary types of information sources. Whereas business intelligence, on the other hand, is something that um, your firm may and should already have. And we're talking about things like uh, financial information and uh, customer feedback from your clientele and so forth. Both are important in the value chain process, so none of them should be um, taken off the table. One of the key tools to use for an organisation um, to gain competitive intelligence is to consider benchmarking uh, your firm against uh, other competitors in the marketplace. And one of the um, uh, aspects or things you can look at, one of the tools you can use uh, is benchmarking analysis that can be obtained from um, for free from providers such as the Australian Taxation Office and also from other providers that uh, charge a fee for it and a lot of these are uh, easily obtained from uh, the um, from the internet, for example, but it's a very in, in, very important aspect benchmarking uh, grant, I think, in the overall scheme of things. Yeah, no, very very helpful. In a value chain environment, um, all firms must consider what their value offer is. Um, does it rely on providing um, a consistently better product or service, or does it focus on cost so it stays competitive against other products in the value chain? Um, if you look at McDonald's, uh, for, for example, um, if they reduce the cost of their McDonald's hamburgers, this action would effectively uh, mean that McDonald's is more competitive than its competitors. But this doesn't mean um, the customer receives value. I mean, the value offer may actually be in 
the way you build your own hamburger, for example, or it could effectively mean the value is in the playground that offers for kids uh, when a family comes into the restaurant. Importantly, um, value chains rely on information and research to understand um, the perceived value at the consumer or uh, end user's uh, uh, level. Creating value is what customers want to trade with your business, so that's an important aspect to consider. It is not fixed or tangible, it rests on perceived benefit, and that perceived benefit is the overall strategy potentially that a firm will need to consider. So what steps are there in creating value? Uh, four in important steps may be the, uh, to understand what drives um, the value for your customer. Uh, two could be the development and promotion of uh, value proposition. So in theory, what makes your offering much more superior than your competitors? Um, and that's a very, very strategic um, uh, aspect to, to have. The third aspect could be identifying segments or, or um, customers where you can provide a more value than your com competitors. And lastly, uh, there could be a focus on value uh, and you can compete on actual value as well. There is an exercise at the end of this presentation that uh, will assist with, with the process to work out your, um, each firm's value offer. Infrastructure relationships is a term used to refer to the overall management function uh, with a firm or, or organisation. Um, in this segment, there are two key issues to consider for management. Identifying market segments with the firm's value proposition. Ideally, what market segments uh, can you be superior in, in contrast to your competitors? And we looked at McDonald's, for example, and how they feel that they are superior in the uh, restaurant offering and the fast food industry that they uh, currently have. Uh, the second one is identifying the firm's strategy in the value chain. Will the firm talk to its suppliers um, and service providers in order to assist in reducing their costs? Or, or perhaps will the strategy be uh, to concentrate on creating uh, an additional revenue stream uh, in its market? For example, that um, vineyard and winery that was in the pre-session notes, if, for example, they looked at going into the tourism or export um, sector to increase opportunities and markets, they could effectively have a cellar door or a restaurant offering in order to increase its revenue, or perhaps if they're looking at uh, an export opportunity, they can probably facilitate the free trade agreements that have uh, recently been announced by the government. So there are aspects there to consider from a, um, a management um, perspective. Infrastructure and human resources are generally closely related when considering Porter's value chain and relate to management, human resources, finance, accounting and information technology. The next slide highlights the strategic management focus associated with the nine building blocks uh, identified through the value chain process. Um, to, step, to, to, establish, sorry, to assist in establishing uh, market segments, there is uh, exercise two at the, at the end of this presentation uh, that will assist in uh, establishing your competition with this regard. These building blocks, uh, in, in, in summary, uh, are as follows. The customer segment uh, relates to continuously reviewing the existing customer uh, segments to expand revenue uh, from each, uh, each of those customer um, levels. Revenue streams highlights the focus on um, value propositions and the revenue streams that are associated with offering a, a superior product. Cost structures uh, relate to continuous review of those cost structures uh, to aim at continually reducing costs, so that's a very important aspect. Key resources uh, relates to the allocation of resources um, to projects or initi initiatives being achieved uh, through uh, decisions of management. Uh, customer relationships uh, um, need to ensure that there is continuous and um, blossom, blossom of information and provide information back to the firm relating to consumer needs. The next one is key partnerships um, and the importance of continually reviewing key partnerships and, uh, for example, suppliers, so the firm can always 
uh, have the latest information on hand um, and to influence decisions of the firm makes. This is actually a pretty critical step. The next one is channels and information. Uh, this ensures the time is spent on research and, and information, so the firm always has the, the latest um, aspects of information on hand. Key activities relates to continuously reviewing the key activities of the firm uh, to ensure that things are still being reviewed and monitored. And the last one is the value proposition, which is, like I said earlier, is, is, is important in our notion of value chains. What is the firm's value offer and pro proposition so the firm can actually be at a competitive advantage to, to most of its other competitors out there? A key challenge for any firm uh, is to ensure that all the people um, in the firm have the same key message and, and they are uh, in sync. It is important for management to ensure that every section of the firm's uh, challenges are connected to building blocks and employees are linked to these building blocks and activities. So the actual slide that you see now uh, has on the left-hand side the challenges the firm can potentially have and also on the right-hand side is the actual building blocks and hopefully they can, they can use to achieve some kind of synergy. As an example of encouraging um, in internal involvement for employees uh, is where a firm may benefit from, from employees identifying an opportunity for the firm to continue to grow or reduce waste in a particular process. So that communication is critical. The firm strategy must always be focused on rela A, relationships, B, the next product, and C, continuous improvement and innovation, as that is the key in being competitive in the value chain process. The three basic types of competitive advantage or, st or strategies for management to consider in the value chain are one, low cost or cost leadership, where the firm uh, sets out to be a low cost or cost leader and uh, in order to exploit things like economies f of scale, for example. Number two is having a differentiation advantage. This is where the firm has a, a unique ability or a skill uh, or a product or service that sets it apart from its competitors. So, so in theory, it's got a unique offering or a unique advantage. A differentiation strategy allows a firm uh, to obtain a price premium in most cases um, that's greater to others in that sector, which is uh, an, an extremely important factor to consider. The third strategy is focus advantage where the firm targets a particular segment and tailors its, tailors its product or service towards a specific area uh, as, they, as they are more or less a specialist in that area. So that's also a key thing to consider. The challenges for management in value chains to uh, implement activities for employees are highlighted on this slide there. In, as you can see it now, there are seven challenges and I'll uh, briefly touch on, on most of those now. Challenge one looks at the notion where employees now are able to work nationally or internationally with process allowing agility, effectiveness and competitiveness. So things like that need to be taken into consideration. Challenge two um, is, the competitiveness, is, is that competitiveness uh, requires faster customer responsiveness, innovation, uh, faster decisions and if, which effectively links with suppliers and vendors. Challenge three relates uh, to a firm committing to growth and the culture that supports it while also controlling cost. Challenge four relates to employees constantly seeking um, capabilities from different aspects and strategies and, a lot, and most of this comes from feedback from management as well. Challenge five is uh, change, change, change. Uh, it's, uh, it, re it relates to um, supporting employees to change and transform um, their processes uh, with uh, calculated risk taking at the same time in order to achieve uh, management outcomes. Challenge six um, relates to how a firm can um, ensure technology is viable and productive and also leverages the business results. Challenge seven relates to how a firm can secure the right employees, they can share ideas and information that effectively creates intellectual capital at the same time. So uh, that is quite an important concept if you think about the collaboration between um, management, 
employees and also suppliers and collaborators, collaborators in the value chain process. The next slide talks about outsourcing um, and, and ways in which uh, outsourcing can be used to assist uh, various aspects of the value chain process. Um, management within value chains must consider the benefits of, of outsourcing and for two basic reasons. Uh, the first one is the, the reduction of costs and the second one is to allow it to focus on core activities. So that's a fairly key uh, aspect there, there Grant. Mm. Yeah. An example is where a firm uh, that focuses on core activities means that things like um, thing, or, or tasks that they consider to be mundane like accounting or bookkeeping for example, which is a, a non-core activity, uh, can be outsourced to streamline uh, their business. Another example is where a firm can outsource the production process to a firm with, a, with, a, with better equipment and a, um, and a lower cost per production cycle. So that's also important to consider. Outsourcing um, to a firm with skills not available uh, within that firm can be very advantageous. A perfect example of that is, uh, is our, uh, my own um, firm where we uh, provide an outsourcing service to small firms um, that are unable to do their um, self-managed super fund, for example, that they haven't got the skill and expertise to do that. So offering that type of outsourcing uh, does uh, help those smaller firms in achieving um, what their customers require, um, which is service at the end of the day. There are also some disadvantages with respect to outsourcing and these could include things around the lack of management control in, in, in outsourcing, uh, possible threat to security and um, confidentiality of a firm's intellectual capital, and also managing the quality of the output once received from the outsource entity. So um, there are some aspects there that we need to consider when making that decision. I think it's probably uh, good to get into our second poll question, Grant, um, at the moment. Okay. I'll just read that out for uh, everyone that's joined us. <coughs> Porter's value chain determines activities can be split into how many categories? A1, B2, C3 and D6. So uh, hopefully... Um, Everyone's read our pre-session notes and they can provide us with an <laughs> a good, quick response. So I think this was something that was covered in the, in the pre-session notes, so cast your minds back to uh, what you would have probably just skimmed through there. Um, I think you might find the details in there. So the question is, Porter's value chain determined activities can be split into how many categories? One, two, three or six? Um, so, uh, so hit your buttons now and uh, have, a, have a stab at that. <coughs> Don't worry, if, don't worry if you get it wrong. It's only <laughs> running here to, to gauge. <laughs> While we're doing that uh, as well, Sash, we've had a, a question in from Steve and Bendigo, and Steve's asked, um, when you're looking at a value chain, mm. um, what's the difference between value chain innovation and what's just continuous improvement? Is that something we're, we're going to be covering? Yeah, there is, that is something we'll be covering um, as, as part of this process. So uh, if you stick with us, Steve, we'll, um, we'll, be, we'll be able to give you a, a nice insight into the difference between the two outcomes. And it's not far away. We're, we'll be touching on it very briefly, uh, or very shortly, should I say. Okay, so... Um had the, uh, the results of the poll in, and the, the majority of you believe that uh, Porter's value chain determined activities can be split into three categories. Close, close, yeah. Page four of the pre-session notes down towards the end of the bottom. Um, primary activities uh, and supporting activities. So uh, it's, it's a two, but that's okay. You're, you're almost there. <laughs> okay, following on. Um, we're moving on to uh, technology relationships now. Um, and the key issue is the understanding uh, the difference between continuous improvement and innovation, which is what uh, Steve wanted to hear about. Uh, technology relationships uh, are, are very important, uh, are a very important aspect associated with value chains. Continuous improvement and innovation are key indicators of a firm's ability to supply goods and services into the future. Um, developing technology or technology improvements should not stand in the way of a firm 
being able to provide uh, products all across the globe, uh, including small firms. And, and by way of example, and, and I'm not too sure, Steve might be aware of this, but uh, in, in Bendigo the, there is a small, a very small firm that uh, supplies a very innovative product to the um, uh, Formula One racing teams uh, all over the globe. Uh, and their product that they produce there is the exhausts. So um, there's nothing really stopping uh, small firms in competing on a global scale. And, uh, um, and if you think about the aspects of, of the notion of, of a formula, all the Formula One teams being how sophisticated they are, and um, they, uh, they actually get their resources from a small firm in Australia. So it just goes to show how important innovation and continuous improvement in is, is in the sphere in the, of value chain. So that's, that's critical. The difference between um, continuous improvement and innovation can probably best be best explained by using uh, an example where, where Sony first introduced the Walkman in the late 1970s, uh, where effectively it changed the music listening <laughs> habits of millions of people around the world and uh, Sony became the industry leader in that sector, making lots and lots of money along the way as well. That was considered to be innovation. Whereas if you look at what happened after that, you had a lot of competitors move into that space and they produced their own sort of equivalent Walkman. Uh, they also produced a lot of money along the way, but they continuously improved the Walkman to add in other little bits and pieces and features. So that's, that's not considered innovation. Um, whereas if you think of an employee uh, on a factory floor, for example, um, and where they make a slight uh, adjustment to a machine by putting in a, a safety guard, that's considered to be continuous improvement. So um, the notion of innovation and continuous improvement, there is a, a sort of a delineation there that you can uh, talk about and you can, you can sort of see. Continuous improvement normally uh, involves making small changes rather than big changes at irregular uh, intervals. Um, it also means that everyone in the firm is responsible and has uh, their part to play in the value chain business principles. It must be encouraged. Factors that can be considered uh, as continuous improvement may be things like, for example, reducing input, uh, reducing errors uh, or mistakes, making processes safer, uh, standardising things and uh, applying technology improvements along the way as well. The outcomes of continuous improvements must also include things like increasing revenue, managing costs, strengthening uh, the firm's culture, and also improving customer satisfaction along the way, which is, which is key. Continuous improvement for, for uh, Japanese manufacturers was a focal uh, point in the, in the 1950s when um, firms in Japan went from having uh, the worst quality to having the best quality by the 1970s. So, um, that there was a, a system there they put in place. A Japanese example in value chain improvement brought about uh, the four R's, which are now colloquially known as one, repair, which is anything broken must be fixed, two, refine, continuously refining the process uh, that leads to incremental improvements, uh, renovate, uh, generally involves improving um, technology advancements, Re reinvent, uh, which is other forms of innovation, but is more uh, a more demanding process, and there's a, and there's a little bit more um, of what is actually involved in that process. A key component of continuous improvement um, is to always try and eliminate waste or processes which do not add value uh, received by a customer. So that's that's a critical aspect to consider as well. There are generally two types of innovation. Um, product innovation, uh, which refers to changes of product attributes, which lead to a change in how the product is noticed by the customer. By way of example, a car with an automatic transmission compared to a manual transmission. Process innovation uh, consists of changes relating to the production process itself. It doesn't necessarily have an impact on the final product, uh, but generally increases the productivity and reduces costs along the way. For, I suppose an example of this is um, the motor vehicle industry that's now controlled by robots as compared to when uh, production lines had um, a human workforce. And you can probably see the 
how that's changed over the years from uh, the Ford, you know, the Ford, Holden, and Toyota production plants uh, that are in uh, Melbourne, uh, and also uh, with uh, Holden in, um, in in Adelaide as well. So over the years, a lot of those robotics have come in and, and taken over a lot of those processes. Innovation often involves research and development, uh, and could be costly, inherently risky for a, for a firm to undertake. So decisions around. Um, R&D must be also considered uh, with respect to innovation and continuous improvement. Developing continuous improvement and innovation in the value chain will always require a commitment uh, from management, business owners and CEOs. This is sometimes or often the, the weakest link to any potential change when considering this. Um, this strategy focus of ensuring the visions and strategies are identified um, by owners and so forth um, and CEOs and the initiative is committed to the business process within, it must be considered to uh, within the, uh, the decision process within the firm, sorry about that. Um, it will also be necessary to involve suppliers and customers to ensure that what is being uh, developed or improved meets the customer requirements at the, and at the end user level because they're the ones buying the product or the service. Information technology uh, is a major consideration for any firm in order to move with the times anywhere with anyone. Um, the adoption of information technology can allow a firm to, to maintain a competitive advantage uh, over their rivals. Firms that use a first movers strategy can use, can use information technology to create new products or enhance their customer service offerings. Firms that uh, follow a low cost product strategy uh, can look to IT solutions to reduce their costs through increased productivity and reduced overheads, which is uh, both of those, um, uh, I suppose, strategies are important in the value chain process. Can IT create economic efficiencies? Well, information technology resources are usually used to um, lower the cost of redundant tasks that can be centralised in one location. If you think about a large corporate, uh, as an example, where they have got various locations, um, say, in Australia, um, and they basically go and cent uh, centralise their payroll function in one office rather than having payroll functions in various offices. This effectively leads to a reduction in, um, in uh, employee costs and overheads to the firm. So uh, importantly, IT, information technology and IT can be used in the value chain to reduce, uh, reduce costs um, along the way. Might be a time, Grant, to look at our poll question number three at this stage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'll read that out for everyone. Which of the following industries could the concept of value chain be adapted to? A, manufacturing, B, mining, C, retail, D, transport, or E, all of the above. So let's see um, how our respondents or um, participants respond to this particular question. So have a, have a vote now, guys. Uh, which of the following industries could the concept of value chain be adapted to? A, manufacturing, B, mining, C, retail, D, transport, or E, all of the above. I think I know what most people are going to vote here, so uh, Okay, good, good, <coughs> yes. And, yep. Yep, it's all uh, in. Votes are coming in now. Pretty much everybody has said E, all of the above, oh, which is good to see. Fantastic, a very learned audience. <laughs> okay. Following on, um, product relationships uh, associated with, with procurement. Um, the key issue in procurement is uh, the significance of relationships in procurement, which is a key issue. Procurement is uh, very important to the value chain and is changing uh, dramatically all the time. Um, from buying a product or service at the cheapest cost to ensuring the product or service purchase contributes to the overall quality, performance and to the end satisfaction of the customer is now a non-negotiable for end users in the value chain.
procurement must be considered from two perspectives in the value chain uh, process overall. The first perspective looks at procurement via your firm's suppliers. This relates to developing relationships where your suppliers provide high quality and continuous information uh, that can improve your product or service offering and lower costs and increase end user satisfaction at the same time. So that's a critical aspect to consider. The second perspective looks at procurement from an end user perspective. Um, having close relationships between suppliers and end users in a value chain uh, means on many occasions contracts are now not advertised uh, and, your, and your firm may be shut out of the value chain. Um, if you look at an example w which relates to Toyota, for example, they work with their suppliers um, in exchanging knowledge, uh, which eventually uh, increase the input quality, uh, resulting in improved cars with uh, very little price increase. So instead of going out and sourcing new suppliers, they actually went and um, collaborated with the existing suppliers to increase that quality at a very, very minimal price uh, increase, if any. Within the next 10 years, um, procurement will change significantly, where firms will adopt strategic management processes, where suppliers, supplier firms will help your business organise, design, execute, process, outsource, innovate, and help manage your own costs within your own firms. And there'll be various ways in which that can happen. As explained by the slide there, there are uh, four aspects we can look at. Our next slide talks about inbound logistics and operations and the key issues surrounding those. First is understanding how the value chain adds greater value than the supply chain. And the second is op operations that must be flexible to meet the customer and end user expectations, which, as I said uh, uh, previously, are both uh, critical aspects. The first of the value chain, sorry, the first of the primary value chain uh, components is inbound logistics and operations. These are closely linked as inbound logistics uh, has a direct influence on the operations of, of, a, of, a, of a group or, or a firm. Operations is also very important to a firm uh, and this is where the product is uh, manufactured and the, and the process and idea conceived. Inbound uh, logistics is closely related to the activities of uh, procurement. Although the latest movements in supply chain management provide um, considerable scope in, and inefficiencies, uh, the value chain places a greater emphasis on the reduction of costs and the management of any material uh, or information effectively. It also strongly focuses on the quality of the goods or information with the end user or customer in mind. Um, so um, the, the actual slide there does have three points that we, can, uh, can, that we can sort of consider as part of that process. So procurement and inbound logistics and operations, they all sort of feed into each other uh, and all part of the value chain process. What we might do here is probably uh, move on to our fourth poll question because I know uh, we're, we're looking at time and we want to ensure that maybe we can uh, access some questions at the same time. So our fourth poll question um, is, how do we view information technology in the context of its importance to your current organisation or business? A, critical, B, very important, C, somewhat useful, D, not that important, and E, not applicable at all. So I suppose various people will view um, information te technology grant in various contexts depending on their business, I suppose. Yeah, and I guess it uh, very much depends on the nature of their business mm. and their particular industry in terms of that, I guess, the weighting they apply. So yeah. have, a, have a head on the buttons now, guys. Uh, and let us know how important IT is uh, in the context of the operations of your company. Um, critical, very important, somewhat useful, not that important uh, or not applicable. Um, be interesting to see how many would uh, rank this more highly in mm. terms of critical. That's right. Yeah. Um, so it looks like the majority are saying 
It's not critical, um, mm. but for the majority of you, you're seeing it is actually very important. Mm. So, yeah. Um, well, that's good to hear because I think uh, a lot of uh, what's happening out there now is moving, and there's a lot of momentum in that information technology space and uh, globalisation uh, overall in terms of doing business these days. Yeah, well, we've just had a question coming as well, um, yep. Sash, from uh, Belinda in Newcastle. Yep. And Belinda uh, wants to know, what's the difference between a value chain and a supply chain? So, yes, yeah, certainly. I suppose uh, if, if you look at a supply chain, um, a supply chain usually revolves your um, direct sort of correlation between um, the the inputs of production and how effectively you can reduce costs, whereas a supply, sorry, a value chain is more concerned with the overall broader concept of from um, that involves the idea of producing something to the actual end user itself. So it's everything that's in between, basically, from conceptual idea to end users uh, buying the service. So it's a combination of suppliers, it's a combination of information, it's a combination of um, having um, input from suppliers, your customers. So it's more broad in terms of its concept and, in, and it sort of involves further uh, aspects within the overall scheme of value chain as compared to a supply chain. I suppose supply chain is sort of self-evident self, self um, um, evident because a supply chain is just supplying things to, uh, to hopefully um, assist and reduce costs, whereas value chain, I suppose, in theory, is everything, everything that's associated with conceptual idea to end process at the consumer end. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of what it is. And, and um, the pre-session notes did have some further guidance in there and does explain the concept of uh, supply chain and value chain in a much more sort of um, diligent manner. Thanks for the question, Belinda. Thanks, thanks, Belinda. OK, let's move on to our next slide, which talks about outbound logistics. Um, outbound logistics still has the requirement to minimise costs in the logistics area, which is, I suppose, if you, colloquially known as transport in a way, and also uh, to minimise the need for storage. A key role under the value chain um, for outbound logistics is delivery and, and um, complaints both being a customer focus because that's where you will see most of the, um, uh, I suppose, outcomes of uh, outbound logistics. Major objectives for, for any firm, um, sorry, major objectives for any, firms, uh, for any firm's logistics planning should involve things like on-time delivery, which is critical for, from a consumer perspective, um, effectively meeting emergency needs if things arise in that regard, Carefully, carefully handling um, uh, merchandise when uh, delivering um, things, and the willingness to take uh, back effective, uh, defective goods uh, and resupply as quickly as possible. So, I mean, if you think about your uh, your major, um, you know, for example, you know, your, your good guys are your Harvey Normans of the world, and, and the way they they work in terms of their supply to customers of goods when they purchase service when you get it at your house is extremely competitive uh, and um, I suppose it's critical should I say. So having experience, I'm sure most of you would have had that experience so you'll know exactly what I mean. <laughs> I think we might finish up here with our last poll question Grant considering I know it's uh, we're heading closer to our uh, finish time so um, poll number five is coming up right now. Okay. I'll read that out for everyone. Um, how, often, how often would you engage with your staff members in order to identify new opportunities? A, always, B, sometimes, C, on very few occasions, and D, never. Interesting question here. Yeah, yeah it's, it's something that um, often gets discussed, I know, in our office, and um, I know there's varying degrees of thought here as to... Um, uh, which, which aspects and what sort of uh, things uh, you can use uh, staff's feedback on in order to improve things. So it's, mm. it's, it's an interesting uh, question. And I, and I would have thought that, um, you know, your staff members are a source of fantastic input oh, for this type of thing critical. as well. So yes, indeed. I, I'd be surprised if the majority don't see always, mm. um, or at least sometimes. Yeah, that's right. Um, so the results are coming in now. Um, so, yes, it does look like the... The majority of you see always, uh, which is which is great to see. Yeah, it is um, great to see because it obviously shows that uh, you value the, the input provided by your employees, uh, which also adds to the, I suppose, the intellectual capital um, that gets 
um, produce within your firm or organisation. Moving on. Value chain marketing and sales uh, is the frontline service to customer and, and, and end user needs with an emphasis on further generation of sales. The marketing and sales teams need to have a clear identification associated with future products and service requirements that lead to the firm providing the development of innovative products. And if you think about Samsung and the apples of the world, this, this sort of gives you a bit of a, an idea as to the thought process behind this. Um, Samsung, as an example, determined that they um, are only going to be involved in markets where innovation is key and consequently uh, they are now involved in, in the electronics products market where innovation is a constant evolving process and everyone sees that through the introduction of new phones, new tablets, uh, new TVs and smart TVs for example so um, that's, that's their uh, value chain marketing strategy I suppose in that regard. Quality in the past um, focused on defining and meeting uh, internal quality and technical standards. Um, value chain has changed this to be a customer focus instead. From an end user or customer perspective, delivering quality service is fundamental to value chains and research shows that it is closely linked to profits. The value chain also takes the view that if you have quality service or products, you have fewer customers, customer defections and stronger customer loyalty. So if you think about this in a conceptual sort of way that stronger customer loyalty will eventually lead to sales, further sales and, and potentially more profits. So having that customer base there and also potentially attracting new customers is critical in the value, value chain process. Customer relations management, uh, which I'll uh, colloquially call CRM for our purposes here, is a um, strategy that should be employed by every value chain firm as it aims to understand, anticipate and manage the needs of any firm's current and potential customers. A focus on CRM in value chains is a shift from the traditional marketing to a focus on the retention of customers while still working on the acquisition of new customers. So that's a critical aspect in terms of the overall or overarching value chain um, concepts. A customer relations strategy allows uh, more accurate forecasting of sales, uh, increased customer retention, increased revenue and profitability for the firm, and much more effective targeted marketing. There is an exercise at the end of the uh, presentation, which is exercise three. Um, which is a mapping exercise that uh, looks at uh, the CRM uh, processes and, and ways uh, you can look at that aspect. I suppose in summary and, and uh, potentially wrapping up, um, at, I suppose at this point we've, we've briefly touched on value chains. I mean there's so much to know about it and uh, um, and the competitive strategies and, and revenue opportunities that are associated uh, with the overall value chain process. So we've outlined all the components um, and the key principles that make up a value chain. Um, and I trust that uh, most of you have gained um, some further understanding of the concepts of value chain. As, as part of the webinar, uh, I'm more than happy to um, forward some additional notes um, from today. Um, and these can be sent to you for your own reference uh, uh, as, as part of your uh, registration process. So I suppose uh, what we've got time for now is potentially some questions if there is anything coming through. Uh, if not, uh, I thank you for your time and, your, and uh, everyone's participation in the, in the webinar. Yeah, and uh, thank you, uh, Sash, as well. Um, so, look, if you are interested, I mean, we've really just, uh, as Sash says, um, we've really just touched the surface here mm. today. Um, it has been an introduction to value chains. If you want to learn more um, or you want your company to uh, become more competitive as part of a national or a global supply chain, um, 
Get onto the business.gov.eu website, have a look at the supply chain facilitation service that's on there. We do uh, go into value chains and we do an analysis of your value chain in a fair bit of detail as part of a supply chain facilitation engagement. So if that's something you are interested in, apply on the website. Uh, the, uh, the details are all there. Um, but really all I'd like to just is to thank Sash uh, for today's webinar. Um, covered a lot of detail there uh, in, a, in a fairly short period of time. So thank you, Sash. Uh, and uh, thank you also for, uh, for joining us this morning at, the, at this hour as well. So um, we will see you next time. Thank you, Grant, and uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.